<laughs> Thank you. Okay. Brief introduction. So, uh, first of all, I need to apologize. I didn't have time to prepare anything, so what, I, what I'm going to present you, I just did literally there five minutes ago. Um, so, very sorry about that. Basically, what I'm trying to do is I'm stalling, trying to stall time until it's all time for you to leave for the premise report by doing a little bit of entertainment and dance. So, um, but what I'll still try to nonetheless talk about it is what we are trying to do, what we're working on in internal projects with lots of PhD students and so on. I'm trying just to give you an idea. Unfortunately, it's sad I don't present you any results or anything nice. <coughs> so, for all of those who have attended the last few uh, presentations of me, like the years before, shell methods. I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> right. Uh, <clears throat> when I told that to the session chairs, they said, that's very disappointing. I should talk about kittens and puppies instead. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Either, sorry. <laughs> right. No kittens and puppies. What I'm going to talk about is probably something where I hope to be very controversial um, with respect to what we just heard from Gabriele and Renato. We all know forward physics simulation as a very important field. We do that in a lot of contexts, and it's actually one of the most important, actually not that interesting, it just loops. I mean, I can see how you're all fascinated. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, it's, it's one of the standard tools, and it's, it's great to see it more and more arise in archaeology, but unfortunately there, as we heard, lots of hurdles to take. And material properties is just one of them. There is one much, much more important hurdle, and that depends a bit on what you want to achieve. And that is simply its complexity theory. The curious thing about a simulation in these cases is that they will always end, hence the loop, with the exact same output. Reality never does, because unfortunately, every little small change in that setting will end up in a completely different final result, right? So we have an infinite space of final solutions, and of course, for us as archaeologists, the question is the other way around. We have the collapse, right? So but what does that tell us about the building how it used to be, or what could have happened at this site? So, just to be very controversial, I should actually stop there. What we're trying to do is we're trying to do an inverse physics simulation. Anyone here with a mathematical or physics background? I mean, at least I should get two objectives <laughs> immediately. You should object as well. All right, tell me, why, 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 why would you object? Because just like when you collapse the block the first time I can go on a number of different ways. There are a number of different modes. Like I was talking about mine that could all have synthesized to create that. So there are different positions that could have come from. Yeah. So it all depends on a load that you don't necessarily know about. Um, and entropy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right? It's a simple word, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, literally, there is an infinite number of possibilities where that comes from. And actually, one still physical, physical, no different. Right? Just physical. Uh, probable solution is that they came from Mars. Right? There was a Martian, and they just dropped it. Physically, that's possible. Right? So the, the point for us, and hence I need to reduce that, we are not, we are not really trying to, do, to inverse it. We are trying to use, I'm just checking what I actually copied in there. Uh, sorry, but <laughs> I forgot what the next slide is. <clears throat> what we are trying to do is give a tool to say how probabilistic a certain outcome, or rather how probabilistic a certain starting condition and certain environmental condition led to that outcome. Right? So we're just giving you a tool to follow an orientation. We're not actually do call it magic or anything like that. So what we're currently working on in this specific case is a church in Toulouse, because we're actually starting with simple things, and it's just about just about material alliteration. Material deterioration due to exposure to weather, right? We all know that, and the interesting thing in all the cases is that we know from the effects that you can observe in the material, you can say what kind of weather conditions actually play a role. It depends on completely on the material, that's all. The simplest case that we all know is how murals, or any painting in fact, 
will fade away and when exposed to sun. So with that information, you get an implicit information about the surrounding, because if it actually deteriorates from UV, it means it has been exposed to UV. That's pretty simple. That's also something that you all know. Um, any archaeologist uses such information constantly, such in this case in Malta, to reconstruct the site based on exposure to weather. This is one of the cases where you can immediately see the effect because the sun, even though it's moving over there, here combined with this salty wind, salty from the sea, really gnaws on that rock and completely takes it away. You will immediately know that given the weather conditions at that side, this must face towards the sea. Over there, with hardly any exposure, this will face in a direction where it's not exposed to the wind. Right? So that's pretty straightforward. The question, of course, in our case is how do you do it mathematically, how do you actually recalculate it? So that's the same, that's the same view, and you can see that if uh, Haga Quim, that's here, you can see that the weather that the side that's actually exposed to the wind from the sea is over here. That's where all the material to children emerge. So in the case of the church, what we have, that's not, not the part of the church, but this is another example. What you can see in this case is, well, what would you think what actually happened here? Somebody kicking it <laughs> with a wall. What do you think, what, just from your own knowledge, what kind of exposure would that be? <coughs> Any guesses? Poorly things. <laughs> well, that's not an unfair effect, to, to be honest. So we can't account for, for something like that. That's wind. It's nothing but wind. Um, and the problem is that you can see in these areas, that's a very simple wind simulation. You can see that these corners here are exposed to a lot of pressure by the wind. I, again, it just takes away the material slowly but surely. What it tells you is basically the opposite way around as well. This is what we are looking at in the, in, in, at the church in this specific case. Is that if you look, for example, just in this case, there is a nice painting here. It's faded, and unfortunately, I didn't bring the pictures. I thought they are not on that laptop. On the other laptop, they aren't. I'm sorry. Um, what you can see in this specific case is that um, you have the church in a bigger space, but lots of alleys leading towards it. There is not a lot of direct exposure to the sun, such so for direct at noon and for in the evening when the sun comes up to it. So you can easily calculate, given the city model, which area is exposed to the, to the sun. What do you do, however, if the affected area is also down here? Right? And actually what, you, we, can, what we just show in this very simple case, and it's actually very simple because some of the buildings are new. Right? We're just trying to show that using this kind of information, you can say something about the layout of the city. So this is a kind of reconstructing what the site must have looked like, basing on the exposure of the wall. And we're trying to put that into a physics simulation, which is a kind of an inverse physics simulation. But, but that's also where I end, and I promise I'll keep you entertained for another 10 minutes, so maybe I should do it. Yeah, or we could go back to the puppies. Um, how about just telling me why I'm completely wrong, because inverse physics is just not possible. Here's your, here's your chance. <laughs> I think I already did actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's one of the laws of thermodynamics. Things move in a non-ordinary state too. Yes. Yeah. But we're constraining the conditions to something that's controllable. And so we're basically just doing a probability analysis. Yeah. I'm just I'm just wanting to make it sound nice. So it might be alright. It might be alright if the wall's painted and you could look at the blocks and determine which ones have got paint on. It might yeah, I mean, it's a big jigsaw. It's a, it's a big jigsaw. We have been doing these, these kinds of analysis at the um, High Performance Computing Center where I used to work for um, city planning a long time. We've done exactly these things, right, in order to identify the points of stress for two aspects. The one is shifting the cities, right, to say we need a different arrangement, which can be something as simple as, in this case, building trees, yeah. right. Um, and, of course, to identify points of stress by 
adding additional material which is actually stronger to that. As said, what we've been planning or, or trying to do even in this context is by saying the other way around, the areas that need to be protected, which kind of surrounding do you need? Okay, shoot. <laughs> I, think, I think it brings up an interesting point um, of probability theory and entropy. And, um, to me, it's so denser shaper theory, which is evidence theory, yeah. which assumes you will never have all the evidence. And I think that works mostly for, for this kind of situation because you're always piecing together a little piece of evidence and it will contribute towards a better <coughs> understanding, but you'll never get further. It's, it's, um, it's, it's not proving anything. It's right. just helping you argue with your yeah. own. Could help. Yeah. Could help. But well, it it helps operates, you, yeah. you, you can put anything in there to the forward simulation and you see whether you put yeah. it right or wrong. Right? The, the idea is how much can you say about the probability that yeah. looks different. Yeah. It's interesting because if you have, say, just like a very simple arch collapse, and you have at least where the distribution of stones is. I mean, you could collapse an arch in a million different ways to figure out which one's closest. But what happens if one day some guy is pushing his cart through and moved one of the stones? <laughs> <laughs> you end up with uh, perturbations in your system that you can't account for. Yeah, yeah. Um, human factor is always difficult. Oh, That's why it's basically human factor, right? You might as well replace human, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't work. But for example, in, in, you can, and that's interesting, if, if, since you bring that up, you can identify whether there has been human interference. Okay. Right. By saying, for example, that certain, that the, it's similar to stratigraphy, right? If the order of the stones doesn't match with any physical simulation, there has been interference. But you don't want to do all fo possible forward simulations. That's the main point. I mean, what you're doing is very nice, but you've already noticed that it takes weeks to calculate. Now, if you want to identify all possible outcomes of different earthquakes, it will take you well the rest of your life. That's <laughs> just about it. Or NASA yeah. or something. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so what you want to do is start arguing logically about whether the outcome could have come from a specific origin. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? Or comments? For the previous presentation, but yeah. that was more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we have at least five minutes and then into the break if you want to. Continue the discussion, I'd be happy to stay and talk soon.